Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So apologies that I haven't done a video for a little bit, number of reasons why. Firstly, I'm having some work done in my house that's been quite noisy in the background when I wanted to film. And equally, I've had a stinking cold and I had a you know sore throat and a cough and a, a croaky voice and all that kind of stuff. So I couldn't even really record um, audio. Uh, I filmed a couple of things I want to put audio over and I couldn't do that. But anyway, I thought I'd come back to things with uh, something that's relatively easy for me to do and that's the next part of the five question series. So, first up, this is a question which gets asked very, very often, and that is a question about my armour. When am I going to start doing videos in armour? And a very simple answer to this is soon. Um, I Obviously, I, I have full harness, but there are certain bits of it, and certain important bits of it, that I've never really been happy with. And I've also got a slight problem in that I've got armour from two different periods, essentially looking at kind of early 15th century and then looking at later 15th century and some of the bits like I've got as you've seen recently I've got a salé that I am happy with but the salé doesn't really go with uh, the rest of my armour it's there for different sets of stuff I'm actually having a brigandine made at the moment which is to go with the salé and that's a whole nother story but essentially yes soon I do need to do some things in armour I'm going to put my armour on but generally speaking because I'm quite a busy guy, I'm often shooting these these videos between doing other things, on the way out, on the way to training, uh, just when I've got home from work, all that kind of stuff. So it's quite difficult for me to put, put, put armour on because it's fairly time consuming and a bit of a pain in the butt. So that's the main reason that um, I don't really do armour videos, despite the fact that I do have armour. Also, just another shout out again to Ian Lespina's um, channel, Knight Errant, uh, and he has a fantastic channel um, talking about armour. So if you have uh, a massive strong urge to get more stuff about armour then go and subscribe to Knight Errant if you're not already subscribed there because he's got loads of good videos already up uh, but yes I will be doing more armour videos and yes I will be doing more things in armour so question number two comes this time from Noah Weisbrod, who's a uh, Weisbrod, I don't know how to say his name, um, who's uh, quite, he comments on lots of videos, so thanks for that Noah. Um, and essentially this is a question which actually loads of people keep asking me and have been asking me since like however long ago it was, two, three years ago that I started putting videos up regularly. And that is about wavy blades or flamberge blades or flame blades or whatever you want to call them, but let's call them wavy blades. I'm not really a big fan of the word flamberge. I think it's been adopted by uh, role-playing games and everyone thinks it's some official term for this type of blade when, as far as I can tell, this, this uh, flame blade, flamberge blade, wasn't really a term that was used particularly a lot historically, although sometimes. Um, and the, the question boils down to, what's the point of them? Why do you have them like that? And the reason that I haven't done a video about this are twofold. Number one, I don't currently own one. I have owned an Indonesian or perhaps Malaysian Chris. Uh, that's spelled K-R-I-S. And if you Google search Chris, you'll see the kind of weapon that I'm talking about. Um, and I have owned one in the past, but I sold it. So I don't have, physically have one of these wavy bladed knives or swords or daggers or whatever to um, illustrate my points. So that's one reason I haven't made a video about it yet an in-depth video. Um, and the second reason is quite simply I'm not 100% sure what I want to say about them. Now, all I'm going to do is throw some ideas out as a kind of stopgap answer to the wavy bladed um, uh, kind of question that keeps coming up. And quite simply, um, they, they are, <laughs> so this is where I get stuck. So when you have a wavy blade, essentially when you hit someone, whether it's a push cut, a draw cut or a chop, you're going to increase the angle that the blade is meeting the target at. Okay, So whether it's the outward curve of the wave or the backwards curve of the wave, if it's the backwards curve it's like you're hitting with a more curved sword and if it's the outwards curve then it's like you're hitting with something like a kukri or a yatagam. So you get some of the benefit of those two types of things. And one of the things with a backwards curved blade or a forwards curved blade is you're meeting the target at a slant, which means that essentially you're instead of the cross section of the blade being like that, it's like it's narrower. Imagine walking diagonally up a hill instead of straight up a hill. So it has a greater slicing effect, essentially. It's like making the blade narrower without making the blade narrower. Um, so that's one advantage of having a wavy blade. Another advantage of having a wavy blade, perhaps, 
is that it increases the ability to bind against an opponent's blade. Now, in many fencing systems and combat systems, when you engage a person's blade, whether it's whether they're striking at you and you strike into their blade, or whether it's more of a, a more of a block, more of a guard or parry, um, or indeed um, if you're closing to try and get a grab on or or doing whatever a beat, um, all of these sort of things. Sometimes you want the blade to almost stick against the opponent's blade and just for a split second and that doesn't mean to bite into it like with two edges eating into each other um, it just means a, a contact and if your blades are very very slippery it can be very difficult to get a good bind and this is one of the problems that people using modern nylon sparring weapons have and they're always talking about ways to make a more a bind that's more like with steel weapons so you can get a better bind with a wavy edge for obvious reasons because the two wavy edges will interlock and interact with each other um, and one other thing, the only other thing I'm going to say about wavy blades at this uh, this point is they're difficult to make and difficult to maintain. Okay, so whatever the advantages are, and some of you will probably suggest in the comments other advantages to wavy blades, such as they're more difficult to grab and things like this. Yes, there are other potential advantages of wavy blades, but definitely the disadvantages of them is they're more difficult to make, very difficult to make. So generally speaking, wavy blades are things that have had a lot of labour put into them. Um, and additionally, they're more difficult to sharpen because you know you can't just hone along the edge. Whether you've got a curved sword or a straight sword, you're, you're um, honing honing an edge is is relatively simple with a with a normal edge. But when you've got an edge that goes like this, it's going to take you a lot of time both to sharpen that initially, but then also to maintain that sharpness. So there we go, there's a few thoughts about wavy bladed knives and saws, and I, I no doubt I'll talk a little bit more about them in the future, but I think I'll wait until I've actually got one in hand to demonstrate and show, because it's a bit clearer. So question number three, the Brewster asks, what was the biggest killer in medieval battles? Well, in medieval war, so this is a different question to what's the biggest killer in medieval war. Undoubtedly the biggest killer in medieval war, unfortunately, was disease, and probably the killing of civilians, um, <laughs> which is fairly grim, but that's probably the reality of it. In a battle specifically, the first thing that I would say before answer, or trying to answer the question, is that um, actually death rates in most medieval battles that we know about, that we have data for, reliable data for, it seems that death rates weren't actually particularly high. So if you look at most medieval battles, you're probably looking at somewhere like, and I'm pulling you know numbers out of the air here, five or ten percent of the losing side dying and that side still losing. Um, you're probably not dealing with huge percentages of the losing side actually dying. And that's why, of course, if we look at um, the Wars of the Roses or the Hundred Years' War, that's why one side or another was able to keep putting armies in the field, because despite the fact that they lost, they still had lots of soldiers left and they ran away and eventually they regrouped and they reorganised, they put them back together into an army and then they had a fight again. So fundamentally what usually happened in a medieval battle is that one side, for numerous reasons, and Lindy Bage has done a very good um, video to do with where do routes start or where, where, do, where how does a route begin and where does it begin in the army and I thought it was a very good video uh, from Lloyd. So, of course, most medieval battles were lost essentially as, as a matter of morale because one side started to lose and as soon as one side, bearing in mind that most of the soldiers weren't professional soldiers, a lot of them were levies, troops in many situations, um, or indeed even if they were you know, mercenaries or whatever, their, their primary concern actually was staying alive and getting loot. Um, they weren't necessarily expected, not most soldiers weren't expected to stand there and fight to the death. Um, only kind of personal retainers and house cars and people like this did that. Um, so if they saw things that were going badly, they would start to run away. And this is the other place, the other time in a battle, when lots of casualties were caused. And we see this at the Battle of Towton, very famously, for example, um, and, and lots of other medieval battles, and in fact just battles from across history. Once one side starts to flee, assuming the side which has won is coordinated enough and still <laughs> together enough, to, um, to pursue, then a lot of death happens, a lot of killing happens in the pursuit, 
rather than the actual fighting. So generally speaking, you should think about medieval battles as, um, let's assume it's a conventional battle and both sides know where each other are. They face off, they pick their ground, one side usually attacks and one side usually defends, in most cases, certainly in, certainly in Western Europe. And, um, and essentially they engage and various things happen during that engagement and at some point one side starts to feel for whatever reasons that it's things aren't going very well and so they start to break off in bits and of course as soon as they start to break off the other side starts to overwhelm and you get a kind of escalation, a, a, a snowball effect and um, a sort of mudslide and, and the, the losing army would then start to flee and elements of the winning army, usually you know men who are able to get on horses, um, would then pursue and kill a lot of, um, of, of the fleeing people. And often, certainly in history, a lot of times what happened is the fleeing side got stuck against some kind of natural um, barrier such as a, a stream or a river or a precipice, a hill, whatever, and this obviously enables more of them to be killed. So as far as I've read, and as co uh, according to most of the medieval battles which I've read about, most medieval battles are to do with um, engagement, this morale thing, like what happens in, in this engagement, and then one side usually breaks as a result of that and is then pursued. There are, of course, some exceptions to this. If we go to um, sort of earlier medieval history and we look at the Battle of Hastings, there we see a body of soldiers who are essentially perched on top of a hill and staying there with the Normans repeatedly attacking them. And they were in a very, very strong defensive position. Um, and despite the fact they did eventually lose, they did seem to pretty much fight to the death. And, and that's partly due to the nature of the army itself, because of course the housecarls who were sworn loyalty to, to Harold um, and the other, the other sort of nobility that was there, they just stayed there and fought to the end. And that's quite an unusual feature in, in medieval warfare. Not to say it doesn't happen in, in other uh, medieval battles and other bits of history, of course it does, but it was generally speaking an, un, an unusual element of uh, medieval warfare. So I hope that kind of goes part of the way towards answering the question. So, question four from The Steel Echo asks, what do I know about the use of bayonets and swords during the Zulu Wars in the uh, end of the 1870s and into the beginning of the 1880s? And um, the answer is I know uh, some amount. Um, it does seem that, uh, so most people have seen the film Zulu, which is um, based around the Battle of Rourke's Drift. Now, lots of things that happen in the film Zulu, and in fact the very location that they picked for Rourke's Drift, are very different to actually the Battle of Rourke's Drift. Now I have looked a little bit into this and it does seem that um, whilst in the film Zulu bayonets are used quite extensively, um, it does seem that at Rourke's Drift specifically bayonets weren't really used or they didn't play a very big part. It does seem that at Rourke's Drift the primary components of the defence of, of the station, of the hospital station, was the mealy bags, so making walls out of, out of um, like sandbags essentially. Um, but with um, melee in them, um, and uh, and the firepower of the Martini Henry, so um, uh, doing doing very very you know as fast high rates of fire as they could, and keeping the ammunition flowing, and um, and and staying behind the defences. It doesn't seem that there was an awful lot of uh, work with the cold steel, as it were. But that's not to say that cold steel wasn't used in the Zulu Wars. In fact, it was, um, and. Uh, the bayonets were definitely used. We know for a fact, obviously, they, they were last-ditch defences at the Battle of Isandwana, which came just before Rourke's Drift in 1879. And um, obviously, because when you run out of ammunition or you can't shoot anymore because you don't have time to reload, you've got to use your bayonet. So we know, sort of by process of elimination, despite the fact that there were very few survivors from Isan Luana, um, we know by process of elimination and some of the archaeology that's been done there that, that bayonets were certainly used in last ditch defence. Um, but uh, what we do know for a fact is that um, certainly in the later campaigns when, the Zulu, when things weren't going so well for the Zulus, um, that both swords um, and bayonets were used and um, the Zulus did have a, they were very cautious about British cavalry and um, some, some sources will say that they were, you know, they were afraid of British cavalry. I don't know how much this is really true. Um, I think that's partly kind of <laughs> patriotic bravado. But um, there are certainly accounts of, um, I believe Beresford himself and others, using um, swords 
on Zulus. Um, and um, there's, I know of at, le at least one account of a person using the point of their sword from horseback. I'd have to search it, but I'm not going to dig out the book now, but I'd, I'd have to search the exact um, citation. But using a sword from horseback and actually thrusting through uh, a Zulu shield. So the thing to remember about a Zulu shield is whilst it is a fairly good shield, it's, it's large and it's relatively light for its size, it's, it's only made of hide. Uh, and you know, with the, with the speed and force of a horse behind you, you can put a sword point or a lance point straight through one of those Zulu shields. Now, that may lead to you getting your sword or, or lance stuck, possibly, but you have nevertheless dispatched that, that one opponent. Um, so absolutely certainly British cavalry, both using their firearms of course, because often they dismounted and fired, sometimes they fired from horseback as well, um, but both using their firearms and their cold steel, the sword and the lance, definitely were used during the Zulu Wars. And actually it's an area of study that I intend to do a little bit more digging into because I think there's some interesting things to be written about that. Currently, your best source of sources, <laughs> um, your best uh, sort of book to go to to find accounts of the use of cold steel in the Zulu Wars is Swordsman of the British Empire by D.A. Kinsley with an intro by me uh, and that's available through Lulu Books and anywhere in the world. And that book, Swordsman of the British Empire and, and its sequels and, and new editions and such, such like, um, is really the only study that's ever been done to bring together as many as possible of all of the primary sources talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat, particularly in the 19th century. It does go beyond that. It does go um, a little bit later and it does go uh, quite a bit earlier, but the majority of the sources are 19th century and there are accounts from the Zulu Wars in there. So finally, question number five comes from Bobby, B0B1E, I believe, who asks, which is my favourite battle from history? Well, this is very difficult for someone who's got such diverse uh, tastes in history and in periods. Uh, you know, I, I'm interested in stuff from the classical period, obviously through the Dark Ages, medieval, uh, Renaissance through to 19th century and even World War One, World War Two. So it's I can't really answer that question. Um, however, it should be fairly evident from anybody who watches my channel regularly that I do quite like the Battle of Agincourt. Um, and it's not for the typical reasons. It's not because, you know, there are people out there who, are, who love the Battle of Agincourt because it's a massive English victory over the French, which it's not really. Um, and, you know, equal, there are people who like it because it's a victory of the longbow and the working class man over the nobility, which it's not really. I don't like it for those reasons. I like it because I particularly, I'm particularly interested in the armour and weapons of the early 15th century. I really like the armour of that period. But, most importantly, I find Agincourt very compelling because it's got a lot of mystery about it. There's lots of information about Agincourt, but we don't really know how it panned out. And we know that there are mass graves at Agincourt, but they've never been found, or at least not in modern times. There, are, there were people in the 19th century who, who claimed to have found bones and stuff, but we, but we haven't relocated them. So, it's, essentially, it's a battle that's hugely famous, and we know lots about, and yet we also don't know lots about. There's still lots of questions to answer about it. So I think it's fascinating. And another battle that's related to it is the Battle of Verneuil, which really, it was known in the time, even in the 15th century, it was known as the Second Agincourt, because it was such a steamrollering success for the English army. And um, I think that's another battle I'd like to study more and learn more about. So I find this period of the Hundred Years' War particularly fascinating. But there are lots of other battles that I find absolutely fascinating as well. The Battle of Poitiers doesn't... The Battle of Cressy, Cressy gets a lot more attention the battle of, than the Battle of Poitiers. But actually, the Battle of Poitiers was almost a, a, a bigger success. I mean, they captured the King of France. It's fairly rare in medieval battles that one side actually captured the king of the opposing side. So the Battle of Poitiers is pretty, pretty amazing. But then looking outside of the medieval period, there's loads of other uh, battles in history which are absolutely fascinating. So essentially I can't say that I have one favourite, but in terms of which I've spent the most amount of time reading about and studying, it's probably the Battle of Agincourt. So cheers folks, as usual with these five questions, ask more questions underneath, and generally speaking, if I'm able to answer them, the questions which get the most thumbs, the most upvotes, um, 
I will attempt to answer them in the next video. Um, but obviously it, I won't answer them, Even, no matter how many upvotes they get, I won't answer them if I either can't answer them, like I don't know the answer, or, um, or if they're just too silly to answer, and maybe I'll save them for one of my silly answers videos. Cheers folks! Thank you for watching, please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, you can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon, or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.